Martin, thanks for uh, joining us here today. Uh, we certainly appreciate your time, and I'm sure uh, many of our U.S. Uh, colleagues are recovering from uh, <clears throat> the Thanksgiving long uh, weekend, so we're very happy to have you join us. Uh, I am joined by my uh, colleague Massimo Dragon, and uh, welcome to our presentation on optimizing transportation infrastructure, routing and siting using a tool and set of processes we call Gold set. So we're excited to have you here today. So a couple housekeeping items before we get into it. Um, you can submit questions and comments in the chat bar, I believe on the right. And uh, there's a PDF of the slides uh, available in the handouts area. So without uh, further ado, um, just some quick uh, quick slide on WSP. So uh, Massimo and I are both are from uh, Goldor Associates, which was uh, recently acquired by WSP. So I'm still trying to wrap my head around uh, some of these numbers, which are, are kind of staggering for me at least, coming from a much smaller firm, uh, around uh, 55,000 uh, employees globally and 14,000 of those involved in the earth and environment division alone. So, um, you know, global coverage at a local scale, really uh, the ability to provide an, uh, services to you and your projects uh, pretty much anywhere, I would say, in the globe. Uh, and uh, now, I guess, uh, one of the, well, if not the largest uh, environmental consulting firm uh, on Earth, so very proud to be uh, and happy to be part of the WSP team. Um, as I mentioned, my name's Kevin Seal. I'm based out of uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada here. I've been involved in environmental consulting and, and focusing on routing and siting for the last 30 years or so. Uh, and I'm joined by Massimo. Go ahead. Good day, everyone. Uh, Massimo Dragon from the Turin office uh, in Italy. 25-year uh, consulting experience. Uh, and uh, 16 years with uh, Golder now WSP. Excellent, thank you. Um, in terms of today's presentation, uh, I always like to start a little bit with the problem and solution that we'll be addressing. So we'll spend a bit of time kind of you know doing, doing a bit of a, a dive on that, uh, and then I'll go through a case study um, focusing more on transportation. Uh, related, since I think the majority of folks here today come from from that area. Um, so we'll do a bit of a case study. I'll hand it over to Massimo. Massimo will walk you through options analysis. Uh, we'll do a quick wrap up and we'll try to have about 20 minutes or so for, for Q&A. But as I mentioned, if there are questions that you have uh, through the course, please feel free to uh, put those in the chat bar and we'll be happy to answer them at the end. So what are we here to do? Um, I, th I think this is a challenge uh, that many of you may be familiar with. And I'll, I'll focus on rail, uh, rail transportation. And essentially the problem is you, you want to site a, a rail right of way or you have infrastructure that you want to, to develop. Uh, greenfield, it may be you know, through industrial areas or through communities or, or through rural areas, but it, but it typically starts with identifying your, your start and end points. And traditionally, what engineers have done in the past is, you know, almost taken a ruler to the map kind of thing and, and found the shortest path of most suitable terrain, primarily driven by engineering and technical considerations, to connect those, those two points. Um, and that certainly has worked through history, but the, the challenge we have now is that the, the landscape is, is very cluttered with all this other stuff. So we have the, uh, we have the social environment, we have where are people, uh, where are they living? What are they doing? Where are they engaging industrial or economic activities? Um, the natural environment in terms of uh, sensitive habitats, uh, perhaps species at risk or species of concern. Um, we, have, uh, we have climate. We have all these different things that are superimposed on the landscape and historical considerations and, and cultural resources as well. And when those haven't been taken in, into consideration, either transparently or through a, through a, a, a definitive process, it's led to challenges to the project, and and uh, certainly in Canada we're we're very familiar with that. It's it's very difficult to advance a project um, now without taking those considerations into effect. And so the alternative is to uh, to go through that process of actually evaluating the non-technical as well as the technical risks to a project and allowing for the optimization of those trade-offs to create a preferred route. It may not be that straight line, so it may not make the engineers as happy as they otherwise would have been, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's the most feasible way to potentially advance a project. And what are the alternatives? Because uh, alternative analysis uh, is a very important part of our regulatory, many of our regulatory jurisdictional requirements. Um, and, and as a proponent, you want to have optionality or maximize the number of options that you could potentially pivot to, depending on, on how your, your process unfolds. So, you know, these are the types of hallmarks, or these are the types of things we try to introduce into the into the methodology that we are proposing. 
uh, and it will present on uh, to uh, to you today. Um, other factors that are really key in this process as well. So aging infrastructure. Um, I think it's World Economic Forum estimates there's about a 15 trillion dollar or 15 yeah 15 trillion dollar gap by uh, by 2040. I think that's probably conservative because it doesn't con it doesn't consider the manufacturing supply chain of actually building all that stuff as well. Um, the other challenge is you you have to maintain and operate that infrastructure while you are transitioning or building whatever you know the new replacement will be and so oftentimes replacing it in the very same right of way or the very same location uh, is not an option and you have to find new locations for it um, as i mentioned you know, incorporating the, the need to incorporate that multifaceted trade-off uh, component of, of projects um, often driven by regulatory or jurisdictional processes and, and again number of requirements which need to be made there in terms of engagement and be doing that in a meaningful way and then showing how uh, environmental social and technical so ESG environmental sustainability governance criteria were considered in a project. Um, I think these things are essential now for, for obtaining social license or what many people are calling social privilege the privilege to construct and operate and own that project. Um, and at the end of the day, some, someone has to pay for this. So you, you, need, uh, you need confident investors that they, you know, when, they, when they put their money behind the project, that they're going to see that outcome and that return as well. Uh, so the, you know, this is a complex environment to, to evaluate projects. Um, and so we, we started developing uh, GoldSet, which is Golder Sustainability Evaluation Tool. Um, I think it's, it's probably a first of its kind. We, we, we began development well over a decade ago. Um, it's been refined on, on many projects since then, ranging from transportation, which I'll touch on today, through pipelines, transmission lines, industrial siting, uh, pretty much uh, you know, any project you can imagine, we have, uh, we have probably applied it. Uh, you can visit the tool. Uh, it's, it's currently undergoing a number of uh, different I, IT uh, gymnastics as we transition to WSP, but you can visit the GoldSet link at uh, golder.com uh, forward slash GoldSet, and you can, you can uh, be introduced to the tool there. Uh, there's three main modules in GoldSet, and uh, we'll spend a bit of time on the, on the siting and routing module today. Um, this is really designed to optimize project infrastructure location. So it's driven by spatial information. And luckily in, in North America and Europe and many places in the world, um, we have an abundance of spatial information, you know, between Earth orbiting satellites and decades of, of, of data measurement and whatnot. Um, provincial, you know, state, federal uh, levels of, of publicly available information are, are, are readily available. But the information in and of itself doesn't have any meaning. So we have to unpack that data and turn it into layers and then attach meaning to each of those layers. And that's really the process of, of how we go through this work um, underlying gold set. The intention is to define a perspective of suitability. So what would be the most suitable um, and shortest path or most optimal location for that infrastructure on the landscape? based on that multi-criteria framework. So how do we do that? A couple of little examples there. For example, wetlands, you know, they're important from an environmental perspective for ecological services. They may also have a human value as well. Um, it's a constraint. Um, we probably don't want to build on it in, in most cases. And there's this idea that the closer we are to that wetland, the, the lower the suitability for development. So in a way, it's kind of a repulsion. It pushes development away from that wetland. And we can be very discreet in terms of where we put those buffers and whether they're a distance to or a hard buffer out to some distance. And the idea is the further you are away from that, the more suitable it would become. Um, the opposite of that are opportunities, for example. So here we may have a road, which we don't want to build, put a train track on, for example, then there might be a setback where we, we have to avoid that area. But there's this idea of co-location. So the closer we are to that infrastructure uh, may be preferable. So it's almost like a magnet and it kind of pulls the corridors and, and routes in. And the more you, the further you are away from that, the, the lower the suitability. And you can imagine if you layer or stack all of these different uh, components of data, social, environmental, technical considerations, we can, we in a very nuanced way, deal with trade-offs because um, some, in some aspects, you may you may want to be near something from a technical consideration, but from a social perspective, you may want to put it away. So those those two may cancel each other. So we can make it very explicit and descriptive in terms of how we deal with the trade-offs that every project has to incorporate in terms of, of its development. Um, and because we use models, these are this is driven by by you know spatial information and models. We often have many many different alternatives, which is one of the goals of our projects typically to maximize optionality. So we have the option assessment module 
um, that allows us to to look at these different options and again examine them in terms of their their suitability criteria. Um, but rather than just a single score, which many projects are, are typically evaluated on performance, you know, uh, say an additive factors approach, we actually look at it on that quadruple bottom line basis. So again, how does the project perform in terms of its environmental, its social, its technical and economic or business case considerations? Um, so this is this is Golder's multi-criteria decision analysis platform. Um, it's, it, it may include spatial information, so it may take the information that came out of the, the previous goal, you know, spatial process on gold set, um, but it can be also quantitative or qualitative information, which is in the non-spatial realm, so commercial complexity, legal considerations, cultural values, things like that. Uh, community feedback can be built into this as well. Um, very flexible. It's kind of, I think of it like a, like a Lego set where we can put the different blocks together and, and allow us uh, to build a model that will meet the, the, the problem at hand. Um, it's driven typically by workshops, so it's a collaborative discussion that we have with uh, subject matter experts, but it can also involve uh, stakeholders, uh, the public, it can involve regulators. We've, we've had project uh, examples where each of those have been accommodated. Um, and there are there are kind of pre-built frameworks within the gold set module. So for example, things like water risk assessment or mine tailings. I think there's a greenhouse gas footprinter. Uh, so a number of models you know, are kind of standardized in terms of their approach um, that have been captured in gold set. So it doesn't have to be you know, a complete uh, start from scratch. We can actually take a model. In fact, most of the time we take a model that's been built before and tested before. We know how it performs and then we modify it to fit the purpose. Uh, and the last module is monitoring and evaluation. So this really um, demonstrates how sustainability can be built into the entire life cycle of a project. So we may build the model during the project conceptualization or project development stage, and that model may have life uh, lifespan throughout the course of the project. So as the project is constructed and then begin, begins uh, operation, um, it may be revisited or, or certain metrics may be revisited through the course of that project that allows us to then track the performance of that project over time. Did we meet the development objectives? How are we trending uh, relative to key metrics? So it kind of gives the project a dashboard, if you will. And, and and for companies, and, and this is becoming something more and more important, uh, for companies where environmental sustainability governance metrics are something that is reported at a senior level, this really simplifies that reporting and, and follow up with stakeholders. So that's kind of an overview of the solution. So I'll, I'll talk briefly here about a, a case study. Uh, this is a heavy rail project uh, that we did in uh, northern Minnesota uh, a few years ago. Uh, very complex, um, natural, urban, industrial, commercial landscape, you know, as many are now in, in, in fully developed countries. Uh, and the challenge was to, uh, to, to advance the project uh, and achieve stakeholder buy-in and social acceptance at the outset of the project. Um, we really wanted to reduce or minimize the, any negative uh, effects on people, on the economy, and, and on the environment. Uh, but at the end of the day, it had to be lowest cost. Otherwise, no one would want to invest in it. And, and obviously, it wouldn't be suitable or feasible to actually operate it. Um, and and uh, there was actually different business cases which had to be built into the model in terms of connection points that represented different mixes of customers. Uh, so there's kind of a market access component to this you know, strategically that was built into the model as well. And at the end of the day, it had to meet uh, U.S. transportation and regulatory approval processes as well, which I am not an expert on, but we had those folks on our team. Um, other considerations that made this, uh, I think, kind of an interesting uh, example is, is uh, stakeholders were actually involved from the start. So, um, you know, when Massimo, uh, Massimo and I became involved in the in the project, we were we were we were happy to find that there was actually the municipalities and stakeholders involved in the decision, the initial decision uh, workshop that we hosted. Uh, so we had interest groups, we had municipalities, uh, the stakeholders were part of the discussion around how this project would be developed. So their voice was heard at a very early stage in this project. Um, I've already mentioned incorporation of non-technical risks of the environmental, social, and technical, along with the technical. Um, another advancement on this particular project is we, we developed what we call the grade tool. Um, and this was this is essentially allowing the software to see the landscape through the eyes of, of a train. <laughs> and if you if you know heavy rail, and I'm sure many of you do, there's really very subtle terrain uh, changes that heavy rail can accommodate. So I think two or two or three percent max. Uh, any steeper in the trains, the trains can't manage that. So what we did was we developed a tool that really allowed us allowed us to sort of look at the trend of the landscape to minimize changes in, in topography and incorporate that third dimension of terrain into the consideration of routes, um, which was, was 
very beneficial for the project because anything that we we produced we you know we were pretty confident from an engineering perspective the cut and fill balance was actually going to work out and as i mentioned meeting the meeting the regulatory processes um, this project like like many we were were involved in actually had an initial route which a third party developed so we were not part of that um, and this uh this initial route had actually been released in the public realm and uh, at a very early stage of development and there was some resistance to it there were some concerns that was that was the concerns that were being generated from certain communities and, and groups uh, so the question was you know is this a good route or are there other potentially more suitable alternatives that could be considered as part of that process um, so just very high level, what is this landscape? So again, Northern Minnesota, you can see there's large uh, water bodies here. There's wetlands kind of everywhere, uh, very complex. Um, there's lots of mining operations and other commercial operations. There's power generation, there's you know interstate highways, there's a, an urban center kind of in the lower center portion of it. So very complex uh, environment. Um, when we started the work, so as I mentioned, we, we obtained the spatial information, we start unpacking it and giving it meaning. Uh, this is one of the products that we use to, to help with that process. Uh, it's called an indicator workbook. Uh, it, the idea is to, to make information understandable to a very wide audience, so you don't have to be expert in spatial information and processing to understand the decisions that are being made. Uh, and we try to present it very graphically. So, you know, again, uh, this is something that can be presented in a, in a community hall or, or digitally through a website or a digital kiosk, uh, on a tablet, uh, what have you. Um, but it, essentially in one page, it describes that one layer of data. So in this case, it's a conservation easement, it's an environmental indicator. Um, we wanted to minimize the impact to, these, to this particular indicator. Um, and we kind of the legal aspect of it where did the data come from how did we process it in very clear steps what does it mean and then we get into how was the data used so in this case our, our balanced scenario or a base case scenario was a constraint it was a high constraint so in that first scenario we really wanted to avoid being in these conservation easements below that middle panel you'll see a little snapshot of what the data looks like so we, we create a binary image of of the the data showing where it is and there's kind of a little topographic representation behind that it's kind of a little hard to see on this slide and then we have scenarios and i'll speak to scenarios in a bit but uh, we actually do three different what if scenarios around this layer as well so we have an environmental scenario um, which increases the constraint level of certain environmental components and so it pushes it away from from new environmental disturbance and in this case we treated it same as our balance as a high constraint same socially so these are important areas from a social perspective but from a technical perspective there was really no reason why you couldn't you know put a put a train right of way through those areas so it was still considered a constraint but it was slightly diminished to a moderate constraint so we use very simple language very simple graphics to explain what the data is and and this product we actually use it during the workshop and it actually speaks directly to our software so there's no data error issues as we translate that over and then we, we process the information to, to actually tell us what the result is. Here's an example of a wetland. Um, in this case, again, it was typically considered a, a constraint, but from a technical perspective, it could be mitigated from engineering design. And so we, uh, we had a special class of indicator called background indicator. So this is neutral. Uh, it has no influence in terms of the routing, but we quantify how much we have impinged on this particular indicator. Uh, examples of, of uh, technical indica indicators. So these are from an engineering perspective. So yeah, as you'll see, these are opportunities. So the, the color scheme changes to green. Um, and these are, these, uh, so being near uh, other linear infrastructure is a design consideration. We try to take advantage of that when we can. Uh, so in most cases, it was, it was considered a, a moderate to high uh, opportunity. So we wanna be close to it. Same with pipelines. Um, recreational areas, the social, the social indicators, these are areas that are important for people. Uh, in most cases, a constraint, but again, from a technical back, uh, perspective, there's no reason why you can't put a, a, a train route uh, or right of way through a recreational area. So, you know, hopefully, I won't go into too many more details here, but hopefully you can kind of see how we structure the data in, in terms of these different layers and how that ultimately uh, allows us to look at trade-offs and different uh, what-if scenarios. So when you look at the landscape through the lens of suitability, this is an example of our of our balanced uh, surface. Um, so the now the landscape you know has has different features that become visible to you that you normally wouldn't be able to see because they're actually hidden in the data. So this is a heat map. 
Um, high suitability is, are shades of green. Uh, very low suitability or high constraint are illustrated by the red uh, shades. And then anything that's kind of in that yellow mid shades, that's kind of in the middle of the pack. And then anything that's white is, is it a full, full exclusion or, or no-go area for, for legal or for fatal flaw reasons. So when we overlaid the initial third-party route over that, View of the landscape, we were able to identify some, some concerns. So it went through those cons conservation easements, it went through active mining operations, which you know everyone said we shouldn't go through those because they're they're highly uh, impactful for businesses uh, and other industri industrial activities. So this was this was a challenged route uh, from that perspective. Um, we also identified pinch points, so a narrowing of of, of options, if you will, where if, you know to avoid it, you may have to go. Quite a ways around it, uh, unless you're willing to to deal with that very high constraint environment uh, from an engineering design perspective, um, and friction points as well. So where where there may be areas where um, you know certain communities or certain groups may have concerns about where that route is, based on the information that we were able to represent. So that's a very different view of the of the landscape. Um, and I mentioned uh, I mentioned scenarios. Uh, we typically start the work with what we call a balanced scenario, and the balanced one is is the first one we take on, and we we as a group of stakeholders or of subject matter experts, um, evaluate the data and try to manually and logically trade off the various considerations that, that need to be made between environmental, social, and technical. So this is, a, this is a hard discussion because we have to find what way would we advance the project under a minimum, uh, a minimum impact scenario. Uh, but it's a really important scenario to have because once we have that as kind of the middle ground, we can nudge the model in different directions to really allow us to do some what if or some sensitivity testing on it. And this is really where the, the optimization component comes in because we have a solution to start with. But if we change the mix of variables in certain ways, we may end up with different solutions. So it allows us to strategically understand how can we change the project to, to represent different perspectives. So I mentioned uh, environmental, social, and technical themes. So typically what we do is we we, once we have the balance, we nudge the direction in a social uh, uh, consideration. So we increase the level of constraint around social variables. The result is that may push roots into more environmentally sensitive areas because we're no longer considering those at the same level. We do an environmental scenario where we increase the environmental sensitivity, which pushes the roots maybe to more towards people. So we have less in environmental impact, but we may have more social impact. And then we have the technical, which diminishes the environmental social consideration and really favors construction operation design, which so we may have more uh, straight routes that are more direct, but we may have more constraint that we've picked up from the environmental and social. So we use, we use the scenarios to really dial in the results. And when we, when we did that work for this particular area, these are the four different scenario results that we, that, that we produce. So you'll see the balance in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and there's three pieces of information that Goldset produces. So first off is the center line, which are those darker lines you see in the middle. That, that may represent the actual route or right of way that the rail may take. Um, the next little boundary around that is what we call the narrow uh, corridor of interest, which is the highest 1% of suitability in that suitability map that I showed you earlier. So this is the really, you know, this is the good stuff, if you will. So it's a little bit wider than the, than the, than the actual center line, but we, we still are quite constrained within that one area. And then what we have is uh, the next widest corridor is that, that kind of orangey area is, is what we call the wide corridor of interest, which is the highest 5% of suitability. So still very suitable, suitable, but may have some level of constraint uh, included in it, but gives you more degrees of freedom in terms of your routing. So you see some things. So we had our origin on the far left and our two destination points. And you see some similarities between the balance and the social where, you know, destination one, that kind of middle one, we were able to get to by a, by a um, slightly more direct route. But to get to that second destination, we really had to go quite a distance to the south and then to the north in order to, to achieve that second point. Whereas the environmental aspect, so when we decreased the social component of that model, it allowed us to have a more direct route to, uh, to the, that far destination, but we still had to go south for the the first destination in the middle there. And then the technical solution is more direct. Uh, and we were able to link those two components together, but there's some really hard bends in there, which from an engineering perspective for rail, that you know, that's that's a challenge. That's something that needs to be addressed. But we were able to demonstrate that there are a number of different suitable options, and we were also able to demonstrate some routes that you probably wouldn't consider because they're just too too far. So the ones that go you know, way to the south and then hook around, why would you, why would you go that far when uh, other more, more direct um, solutions were potentially indicated as a result of that? 
Um, so, you know, here's an example of, of how we went through that process and how we how we uh, were able to demonstrate more options under consideration for the project, which was which was a benefit. Um, this is the last slide I have on the on the uh, the, the case study. Uh, this is another product we produced called the Metrics Workbook, uh, which is really a dashboard of all the results in a very simple kind of one-page format. So again, all four scenarios: the balanced environmental, social, technical; the length, because length is an important consideration for rail. It costs for every yard of of rail you add, there's an additional incremental cost. We included the options to both destination one and destination two. I'm just providing destination one. Um, and it provides a graphical view, which is suitable for, again, putting it in that public realm through websites or at an open house, of, of what did the project avoid and what couldn't it avoid. Uh, so it ties into the environmental or social impact assessment process uh, because we're able to identify residual impacts. Every project has residual effects. You, you can't avoid everything. So the constraint uh, represented by these red bars, high constraint, moderate, and low constraint. And then the opportunities, again, high, moderate, and low. We can see in a percentage or area uh, component how much was left over in the project. So these would be the, the, the effects you would have to mitigate in terms of the impact assessment process. Uh, and the net benefits are the ones that you can, you can uh, essentially um, uh, you know, describe as being net beneficial to the project. So they're environmental, um, um, they're environmental positives. Um, so again, this is something you can put out in that, uh, that, uh, that public realm and it allows us to iterate. So when we make decisions, we, we look at our initial assumptions, we look at the results and we look at the dashboard and we ask ourselves, well, is there something we need to change or could we do different? And it becomes a, a, an iterative process as we go through that, as we refine and optimize that final result. So that's all I had on this case study. So I will turn it over to Massimo. Thank you, Kev. The, so the next section of this uh, presentation is to go through the, the other two modules and we're going to spend a, a bit more time on the options analysis uh, one. This was uh, designed uh, to provide um, uh, teams, uh, stakeholders and subject matter experts uh, with a platform where you could perform a multi-criteria decision analysis. So in, in the life cycle of the process uh, um, that Kevin described earlier on, this could be the next uh, logical step uh, after uh, you've completed a siting uh, or a routing exercise, or it can be a standalone module that is used uh, uh, in case you already have options uh, uh, on the table and you want to compare them in terms of uh, uh, their performance on the you know, three or four dimensions that we typically that we typically use. Let's move forward, Cap, please. The this slide provides. Uh, an overview of the process. Uh, so regardless of how you uh, got to a, a set of options, uh, uh, essentially this is where the options analysis uh, module uh, will start. So the first uh, exercise uh, that is performed is to uh, review the set of options uh, available and then decide which ones are feasible. So is there any residual fatal flaw um, condition that wouldn't allow you to move forward with one of the identified uh, options? Once you have your set of uh, um, of alternatives that you want to evaluate, uh, you would then be using one of the modules uh, uh, that are built into the option analysis module or create a, a custom one and essentially have uh, uh, your suite of uh, indicators that will be used uh, uh, to benchmark and compare those options. And they can be organized in four dimensions, environmental, social, economic, and technical, or you sometimes you would combine the economic and technical uh, dimension and have a, uh, a triple bottom line uh, uh, type of evaluation. The outcome of the process uh, is to allow you to have a comparison uh, that can be done either at high level on the dimensions of the analysis or that you can drill down into more details and have uh, a detailed evaluation of the performance of each of the options uh, on the entire set of criteria. The, the tool is um, available and enabled as a web platform, and it's been designed to uh, be to follow the logical flow of a typical multi-criteria decision analysis, where you start by pulling your options, um, defining what is the library of indicators that you want to use, uh, then go through the exercise of assigning a relative importance to the criteria, so the weighting exercise. Uh, you would then uh, use the tool to either import or enter 
quantitative and qualitative uh, uh, information that will characterize the options and then you would move into the last stage that we call the interpretation stage where you would be uh, essentially be able to compare uh, the performance of the options that you have uh, uh, that you have selected for this uh, for this project further uh, steps uh, would allow you to characterize the different options so this uh, infographic that we've produced uh, essentially gives you the performance uh, uh, of each of the indicator or the themes that were used to characterize, uh, in this case, three options. So you're able to provide um, your audience or use it as a, as a decision analyst to actually see uh, the performance uh, in all the criteria and uh, uh, dimensions that you've used, uh, as well as um, uh, have a more combined uh, and synthetic view of the, of the outcome. So in this case, uh, option the option that uh, that satisfies uh, in a more balanced way all the different dimension is the uh, is the option uh, three A's and we are always uh, aiming at having uh, options that uh, are performing uh, ideally uh, well on each of the dimensions so that uh, the robustness and the reliability of that solution will satisfy uh, all the four dimensions uh, in the analysis. Once you, you have done uh, an initial assessment, uh, you can also dig deeper into the underlying reason uh, that differentiate one option from another one. So sometimes we do uh, an influencer's uh, analysis uh, where we provide evidence of uh, uh, which are the key indicators that allow you to differentiate one or multiple options. Uh, so uh, that this gives you an additional level of information of which are the, the main drivers uh, that will favor uh, a specific option. Next one, please. In terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the next stages, uh, typically you would have uh, um, selected one option and that one option, uh, as it goes through either permitting processes or through an implementation phase, uh, then you're moving into the uh, you know the actual execution of that uh, of that option. This is usually where um, additional criteria would be very relevant uh, during the life cycle of the of the project. So you would want to verify that your assumption that that probably drove your uh, uh, initial analysis are also proven true during the uh, construction or the execution phase of the project uh, and later on in the monitoring of the uh, of the operation of that uh, of that facility or of that infrastructure. So in this case, uh, the monitoring and evaluation module, uh, that is the next logical step in the uh, in the decision uh, framework that we created, allows you to set up those uh, indicators and those KPIs that you would be uh, using to compare the execution phase of the project or monitoring phase of the project, and will allow you to show. Uh, or identify early on if you're tracking the performance that you were expecting. So you can set up benchmarks of how your um, sustainability criteria or your performance criteria uh, were anticipated. And then through each project phase, uh, you can enter the actual data that you're uh, collecting as the project uh, uh, is implemented. And the tool will allow you to show deviation or uh, even have projections of, okay, you know, if this is the current trend, then in the next phases, you may uh, exceed uh, uh, your uh, uh, the benchmarks that that uh, you had uh, identified earlier on, and so this would provide uh, the project teams uh, an opportunity to uh, maybe go back and implement uh, mitigation measures so that uh, you know if, if a deviation uh, from the norm is uh, identified early on, then it, it can be mitigated without waiting for those. Uh, uh, you know, exceptions or exceedances uh, to actually materialize. Kevin, I'll hand it over to you for some concluding remarks. Oh, actually, sorry. The, the, the final, uh, the final uh, consideration is on uh, uh, communicating uh, the options uh, effectively. And so uh, you've probably seen we've, we do an extensive use of uh, infographics um, throughout the process. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a candidate site profile. So we also uh, 
want to uh, express the importance of effectively, uh, convincingly and transparently communicating what are the key factors that went into the analysis and uh, generate outputs that would allow you to you know, share the decision-making process uh, to the stakeholders, either within the companies or with external stakeholders uh, as the project uh, requires. Great, thanks Massimo. Turn my camera back on. Um, so we'll wrap up here um, just with some some final thoughts. So, you know, in terms of key outcomes, um, you know, the, the thing that I find interesting about doing this work is I think it's if you if you talk to most people uh, about, you know, would it cost more money to incorporate, say, environmental sustainability governance criteria? So, you know, the types of work that we're, we're talking about, if it, would it cost more to include that in your project um, or would it would it save you money? And I think most people would would probably say, well, I think you know that would probably add additional cost for my project. And in every example where we've done this work, especially where there have been existing routes that have been done from past work, we have been able to save cost and significant amounts of cost. So you know, typically 10, I think, was our our worst case to around 30%. Um, and for some, you know, infrastructures, I can recall we were working in a in a in a uh, you know resource extraction industry with multiple you know hundreds of sites that needed to be connected together uh, by roads and pipelines and and electrical uh, you know conductivity and stuff like that. Um, you know, so we were able to mutually optimize the siting and the routing component. You know, we were able to save them you know hundreds of millions of dollars ultimately on that overall solution because we could iterate it and do that that kind of what if uh, optimization for that particular development. So um, so there are substantial savings to be had, you know, by incorporating this information into projects. Uh, improvement on ESG performance. So again, so, you know, this is our suitability view of, of the world versus just that, that, you know, kind of, you know, more information or more, more technically informed project view. Uh, and again, uh, being able to improve project performance along environmental and social criteria. Um, it doesn't take a long time to develop these types of projects. So I think our world record, not that I'd ever want to do it again, <laughs> was we were able to complete an end-to-end -end project in, in less than a month. Um, you know, it was kind of a year-end budget constraint. Um, and from the point that we started to the point that we handed over multiple, in this case it was a pipeline study, um, took less than a month. Um, typically one to three, but once the models are built, the iteration is, is rapid within, within days. Our, our ultimate goal is to be able to do this in real time in a, in a workshop environment. Um, you know, and that, pro that processing power is now available for us to start to, to look at that as a scenario. Um, so very quick iteration. This is really, these tools are purpose built to support stakeholder and public engagement. It's, it's all about uh, providing visibility and or transparency on the decisions and criteria that were used to develop the project. Um, and we've heard that time and time again from regulators, um, you know, that when we do undertake this process and we do, do, uh, we do provide uh, regulatory submissions, um, they usually are turned around more rapidly because the regulators have said, you guys did the hard work of addressing the environmental and social component, um, the technical component fit into it as well. So we had one example where, you know, a, 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 believe it or not, a pipeline in downtown Toronto um, was turned around in 120 days. So the minimum time that the regulator said that they would need to make that decision, they were able to make, um, and, the, and the, the proponent was able to get approval to, to construct. Um, and the, the reason for that was they, they could show how they addressed the environmental and the technical along with the social components as well. So that's all we had for you here today, and I think we're pretty much on time. So if there are any questions, we'd be, we'd be happy to uh, take a few of those. Thank you, Kevin and Massimo, for a fantastic presentation. So before moving into the Q&A period, I, will, I would like to remind attendees to enter your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform. And also you can download the PDF version of the, this presentation from the handout box on the dashboard. Uh, we start with the first question. Does GoldSet work with digital twin technology? Digital twin, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, for those of you that may not be familiar with that term, digital twin is essentially where you create a, you know, a virtual representation of the project. And they can be quite detailed, like literally down to the nuts and bolts uh, and girders of, of different projects. Um, this does fit into that approach uh, because it is a simulation of the project. Um, if we're thinking back to my previous example of, of the linear you know, transportation infrastructure, 
um, at a high level, you're essentially simulating a right of way. So what it allows you to do is, is pre-test. So the purpose of a digital twin is to kind of experiment on it. <laughs> you can do things with a computer model, you know, like just like video games, you know, you can blow things up and it, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, you can come and you can discover problems or challenges or design considerations that, you know, you may not be able to anticipate by other means. So, so this tool does fit into that. I would say maybe at a more early stage in the process, uh, where we're not, you know, the detailed design considerations are not fully, uh, fully understood, and nor should they be at that stage. You're still kind of going, well, where can I put things? Um, so we can do it from a writing, routing perspective, where we can simulate that route of, right of way, and we can conduct experiments on it to see how it will fit through that environmental, social, technical perspective. Um, same with siting. So, you know, quite oftentimes we're siting terminals or, or stations along the length of a, say, a real, again, rails is one example, but also, you know, electrical transmission as well, uh, substations and so forth. So you can kind of pre-test that location based on does it fit in terms of the size of my development footprint and how I can potentially configure it. Um, does it fit in terms of the, you know, the social aspect of it, that community, the, the people's requirements, um, you know, other industries which may support because, you know, every industry is dependent for inputs and outputs on how it operates. So yeah, it does, I would say it does kind of feed into that, uh, but maybe at an earlier stage. So Massimo, you've probably got familiarity with this as well. No, I agree. And I think, uh, so the other, I think, interesting note is that uh, since this is a digital uh, process in itself, uh, it produces output that are, that is uh, digitally compatible, compatible with the technologies that are typically used for digital twins. Uh, and, you know, part of our, uh, our deliverable is actually the the digital expression of the of the selected uh, site and all the information that went into it. So I think it's also a great uh, uh, starting point for you know, the, the stages that uh, typically are, are followed when developing digital twins. Fantastic, thank you. Can you combine siting with routing analysis as well as option assessment? Uh, yeah, this would be the you know the hat trick, all three combined in one. Um, it it uh, and we have done projects exactly of that sort, and it typically starts with the siting component because you need to figure out where stations go first. So where do, where are my start my start and end points, and what are the pieces I need to connect in between? So transportation often encounters this when they're you know particularly rail um, when there there's there's points that need to be you know addressed for, from a station perspective, but also transmission as well. Uh, so we figure out the optimum locations for for where stations are, and then we begin to looking to look at the optimal routes that will connect those. Um, but there's also some some iteration in that process as well. So for example, if we we may have really really good sites, but if we are going to route a, a train, you know, uh, railway or any of those kinds of things to it, we may have to go a long way around to get to those points. So if we can change the terminal locations that might result in more optimal routes, then, then we sometimes look at that as well. So there's there's kind of a mutual optimization that goes back and forth on that. Um, and you can imagine you generate a lot of options. I think, you know, there was an example uh, in Northern BC, Northern British Columbia here in Canada, where we did a, a thousand kilometer long pipeline route. And it had uh, 72 different combinations of start and end and interconnection points. Um, so that's 72,000 kilometers of pipeline we were we were modeling, and uh, then the so it, instead of creating a route, it created a network, which was kind of interesting. So then we had to figure out through a process of fatal flaw analysis and and other types of elimination, um, narrow that down to you know what are the most feasible interconnection points and routing points. So it generated a lot of options, and then that's really where that option assessment module that that Massimo uh, spoke to um, really comes in because you know models. <laughs> it's easy. Well, it's it's it, it, one of the one of the compulsions with models is to look at different versions of it and different types of outcomes, and then to be able to test those against one another to find the best one to optimize it. Really, so that's where the option assessment piece really comes in and allows us to to find the quote unquote best solutions based on that combination of start end and interconnection points. I don't know, Massimo, do you have any thoughts on that? So I think automation was a uh, key to allowing to build models that would be either you know single component or as you know, the most intricate one would be you know, siting and routing, uh, mutually influencing, them, influencing themselves, and then being able to draw some of the data into the options analysis and then add the additional criteria as, uh, as required. So 
a lot of the investment that we've done in this decade was on, on seamlessly evolving the code to allow us to do quick turnarounds in terms of the number of scenarios that we would be generating, as well as the interoperability between the different modules so that uh, uh, that doesn't become an obstacle to experimenting and to evaluating multiple multiple options. And I think you know optionality has always proven to be a key to success and the robustness of the of the outcomes of this uh, of these exercises. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Is the evaluation criteria used to examine project cust customizable, or is it the tool is it the tool pulling from site? from set of data points that cannot be easily modified, uh, supplemented, or changed? No, so I think, um, uh, Kev, yeah. Kev, if you want, I can go for this. So, the, so uh, it's actually, the, both are, stre both strengths we're uh, leveraging. So there's customizability. So you don't need to start with a fixed set of criteria that you cannot change, as well as uh, in the 10 plus years of developing modules in goal set. So a module would be, let's say, it, uh, a reference set of criteria that typically are supported by uh, literature evidence or by regulatory regimes. Uh, you never start from scratch. So you always start from essentially leveraging the knowledge that was built into all the projects that we performed, and then you can build on top of it. Uh, so you always have a, a reference starting point to start with because likely we have been uh, developing projects of that nature or of a similar nature, as well as there is the flexibility to embed uh, uh, the criteria that may be specific to uh, the objectives of a project, to a specific uh, geography, to a regulatory requirement, uh, to the stakeholders that participate in those uh, exercises that naturally will have their points of view and part of you know, our our objective uh, is to you know bring the multiple point of views in the picture so it would be counterintuitive to enforce a set of criteria and then solicit the input from stakeholders thank you um there's a nice question here about your experience if you can share what are the main obstacles in soliciting input from uh, stakeholders about their options is there a meeting a focus group and how long does it usually take how many people are involved in this kind of meetings nobody to take a crack sure. at that <laughs> i'm sure you have thoughts as well um it it really depends um uh, you know, we have done, uh, we've, we've, we've adopted all kinds of strategies. So, you know, with, for example, in, in Canada, that's, you know, my, my home market, um, working with Indigenous groups, we, you know, we typically first work with the proponent to come up with a set of options that we know are not the right answer, but it starts somewhere in terms of, you know, where are our roots, where are our sites, and what information have we included in it. And then we usually, you know, put together a package or a presentation and a letter and an invitation to various Indigenous groups to participate in the process. Um, and then quite often that, well, lately it's been virtual because it's very difficult to get together by by, by face to face. Um, but we we have a meeting with the with the various communities and we talk about the project and we talk about what information uh, or what concerns they may have and what information that they may have that's new to the process. So quite oftentimes we will sign uh, you know data sharing agreements because you know many communities are are sophisticated in terms of where you know what information they have available, but it's not available to the public. Um, and so we we sign agreements, we incorporate that into the process, and we see if that affects the results or if it changes anything, or if we've 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 uh, included that you know from other indicators that we've developed. Um, so that's one example. Uh, you know, another one is is the one I mentioned where you know the the, the the municipalities and the stakeholders were actually part of literally workshop one. Um, you know, the first hurdle to get over is you know, do you agree the project should go forward that it has merit? <laughs> yes or no. And if it's a no, that's usually a hard stop. But if it's a yes, then it's like, okay, well, we're not against development. We just want well-informed development. And so, what does that discussion look like? Uh, and it is a discussion. So, so you know, typically it works through uh, you know, workshop-based process. Um, and then that would you know be a more direct face-to-face -face informed uh, way to inform the project. But we've also done, and Massimo can speak to this. We've also done digital stakeholder engagement as well, where we've we've put uh, a model of the project out there, including the criteria, and people can now interact with that information and maybe play with the dials a little bit in terms of how does it, how that changes the outcome. So. It really and and you know open house events too. So uh, you know I've been in open house events where literally the pages of, of our workbook have been you know the key variables at least. You don't want to overwhelm people, 
um, were kind of part of that process and people were allowed to comment on it in terms of, of their the attributes. So Massimo, you have some good examples of this too. Yeah, and I think uh, so part of the communication uh, products that we've developed uh, are really there to leverage the opportunity of soliciting input from multiple stakeholders. The uh, One of the key advantages is that uh, if, if, the prop, if the project uh, embeds multiple point of views uh, and the input from multiple stakeholders, then from the beginning you have a buy-in of the stakeholders because they have participated in forming that uh, uh, that model or that set of options or uh, the idea to explore uh, some uh, some scenarios. So there's a always so people will ne will never be disconnected to the, to a model that they have participated uh, in forming. So I think more than an obstacle, we actually leverage the opportunity of uh, embedding multiple stakeholders input um, in different uh, shapes or form and we use communication uh, tools to you know make the process accessible as well as uh, provide uh, uh, you know uh, easy access to the information and that will support forming those criteria thank you you mentioned in the presentation optimization how do you know that you have the best solution um, it's it's a bit of art and a bit of science. Um, that's where sensitivity testing and scenarios are are really important um, because it does allow you to you know kind of test those different solutions against one another. Um, and what it usually means uh, are different combinations of trade-offs. So you know, and these trade-offs have to be you know have to be real. So for example, are you willing to uh, spend more money to create a longer route route to go around something? In order to achieve a regulatory approval or or social license, you know, and this is one we see quite a bit, where, you know, the engineers <clears throat> normally, you know, without considering these things, may may be inclined to potentially, you know, go through those areas. But when you actually bring in that social value, that environmental value component of it, um, you know, you start to see through that lens that it may be more beneficial at the end of the day to, you know, to spend. You know more capital to avoid going through those areas um, so what does that look like well you know uh, avoiding avoiding something may shorten your regulatory permitting uh, approval by you know years in some case so you know it, it oftentimes can be the difference between a project going ahead or not going ahead you know based on some of the decisions um, you know the one thing that I, I probably didn't mention but you know the, the the tool that we've developed is always looking at minimum length so it's always looking at the shortest distance of highest feasibility or lowest constraint so even though it may be a wiggly line you know when you look at it on the map it's still the shortest path of highest suitability of given that given that particular view of things so so the tool is always trying to to, to minimize the length which is usually the optimal you know solution in terms of the the various trade-offs that were represented on, on that landscape so Massimo again you're you're actually down in the code of how we do this work so so <laughs> thank you and so I was I was actually you know uh, trying to take the garage view of the of the tool where there's the data science component to it uh, so under the hood we actually look at uh, how the criteria were selected uh, how the waiting process uh, was performed uh, and if there's any you know dominant criterion that is actually uh, you know, pre preventing us from actually having an optimized uh, uh, solution. There was a slide uh, earlier in the presentation on uh, the influencers and not influencers. So we always provide uh, um, a point of view from uh, the technical analysis of the data to make sure that the model is essentially not biased. So if you wish one another way to answer the, uh, you know, how do we make sure that uh, our solution is uh, is optimized is because we also look at potential um, issues uh, in, of, of bias in the way that the model was developed uh, and can provide uh, you know also a, a technical metric on the robustness of the outcome thank you um, another question here could, could i use the gold set gold set tool on an existing project or a one that has already uh, under development to evaluate some certain uh, risks um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, yes, um, you know, and again, that, that case study that I, I provided, you know, there was kind of an existing route. And actually, now that I think about it, you know, I would say more often than not, uh, we're brought into a project that has already undergone some level of design work. So, you know, the team or the proponent has started to, to do, you know, some engineering design and they may have some conceptual roots. 
and they start to realize that they're getting into problems. <laughs> you know, they're 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 re, you know they're they're coming into perhaps some areas where there may be higher environmental constraint or higher social resistance or challenge, and so they're trying to find a path forward for the project, um, or they want to understand the performance of it, or they want to look at different alternatives. So they have they have it's hard to come up with alternatives. Uh, it really is. Um, you know, if you've ever tried to do this process manually, you know, um, you have to kind of go, okay, well, what, what, what's a different design basis or protocol for me to find a different route through this, you know, urban area or, or whatnot. And there may, you know, that sometimes, in some cases you may, you may be constrained. You can only go in certain spots, but in other places, you know, that may be a little bit more of an open question. So the, the, and, and the other challenge is, you know, when you do come up with alternatives, what's their rationale? Like what, what made that alternative different? Why did you do that differently? And, and being able to explain that to the regulator. So quite often we're, you know, we're, we're kind of brought in to test the project in their initial design, see if we can improve it and optimize it. And, and, you know, in many cases we can, or provide options which are, you know, equally or, or, you know, have a high degree of, of suitability that they can advance through their you know, alternative means, say for an environmental assessment. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there, I would say there's quite a, kind of quite a, we could kind of work within each of those realms. I know Massimo, you have thoughts on that. Yeah. Just one, a simple one on, uh, I think one of the differentiators uh, of goal set is its ability to simultaneously incorporate uh, the different dimensions. And so typically some of the projects that we are brought in uh, get into trouble because they've started from a technical perspective and then they, mm. then they started to see the environmental issues. And then, they, and then on top of those, there were the social issues that aggravated the uh, the problem, and so our our approach is to actually try to embed all those different uh, components that inevitably, at some point in the life cycle of the project, will have their influence and put them together, so that uh, searching for those trade-offs is done as a design uh, principle, rather than you know I'll do it technically, hoping that uh, environmentally I won't get into trouble or that you know people mm -hmm. will accept it uh, afterwards. Fantastic, yeah, thank exactly. you. I will take, uh, sorry, Kevin, you wanted to... No, I was just saying no, it's good. Okay, thank you. I will take the last question. Uh, does the tool incorporate state-specific permit and public notice requirements? Um, yes, it can. Actually, um, we've had we've had cases where there is a predefined model, which, you know, a regulator, a state or a provincial regulator, a federal in one case too, um, stipulates like this is the model that you will use, and we've essentially replicated it in Goldset in their in their option assessment module. Um, sometimes they use different you know rating scales or different ways of normalizing and scaling the data, and we have to kind of work around that. But um, there are there are models which are you know prescribed, if you will, in the in the regulatory realm that we've then emulated in in Goldset. Um, on the siting side, same thing. Like there's been a stipulation in terms of you know wetlands are this many times more important than other components or they have a value or a rating and we can we can replicate that um, that rating system or that weighting system in, in our spatial analysis as well so yeah it can be done fantastic thank you so we're at the end of our webinar session uh, mm -hmm. please feel free to follow up directly with Kevin and Massimo via the contact details shown on the screen and I would like to thank everyone for joining today thank you very much for your time and thank you uh, Kevin and Massimo for a fantastic presentation Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Have a day, great, great day, everyone. Thank you very Thank much. You. Cheers.